Um, let's go ahead and begin. Welcome everybody uh, to our first Hudson Colloquium of the fall 2022 semester. Um, we are glad to have you with us. Um, if you're joining us via Zoom, uh, you can't smell and taste the delicious food that uh, the uh, Chang family has prepared for us. Uh, thank you very much, Sun Chong and you too. Um, our uh, talk today is drive-in movies, solar panels, and nice angle optimization problems. And um, let me just, Tim, since I can see you on the screen, can you see the, the slide there with that title on it? On your Yes. Screen? Yeah, okay, very good. Um, so let me first mention that this is a joint work with um, Nadu Lawson, who uh, is joining us at least for part of her time on her break um, uh, via Zoom. So we're delighted to have you with us, Nadu. Um, we had a, a paper recently published in the College Math Journal, um, May of this year. And uh, I have some copies here. And if, for those watching on Zoom, if you would like a copy, just send me an email and I'll happily send you the, uh, the link for that. Um, but our work was in turn partially inspired by a, a paper co-written by um, some Georgia Southern colleagues before they were actually colleagues of ours. Um, among them, you may see Kwa Wong in there, um, Colton Magnet, who is a former Georgia Southern associate, um, some students and others. Um, but they uh, looked at integer solutions to box optimization problems kind of a the famous calculus problem. Do you have a, a sheet of cardboard or paper? Um, how should you cut out squares from the corners to fold it up to make a, a box of the largest possible volume? Um, so we kind of uh, took that topic in and modified it to look at angle optimization problems, um, which were some of my favorite uh, when I enjoy teaching calculus. Uh, so let me just point out, during COVID-19, drive-in movie theaters made a good comeback. They were almost extinct, but uh, lots of people all of a sudden wanted to go to the drive-in movie theater. They could stay enclosed in their car and still watch the movie theater. Um, so that brings to mind a nice question for both uh, movie lovers and calculus teachers. Where should you park to get the best view at the drive-in movie theater? Uh, and that may sound a little vague, but we, we can make that mathematically precise. Now, uh, if you can, you should park uh, closest to the center of the screen, right? Rather than the left or the right. That part's pretty obvious. But the uh, interesting question is how far back from the screen should you park? Um, and let me make that more precise with a specific example. Suppose you've uh, come to a drive-in movie theater that has a screen that's 25 feet tall, and the bottom of the screen is 20 feet above your eye level, right? wherever that might be in your vehicle. Um, how far back from the screen should you park in order to get the best view of the screen? All right, so that, that's our question. So um, here, all we really need is a, a two-dimensional side view. Um, let me uh, go to the next slide where I kind of explain some of the, the letters there. E represents the, um, the eye, the position of the viewer's eye. T, I uh, can't quite see up there, sorry, is the top of the screen. B is the bottom of the screen. And O is this point on the horizontal line from the eye level that's directly below the, the screen, okay? So uh, if we call X the horizontal distance between O and E, the question is we wanna find the value of X that will maximize this viewing angle theta, right? So that's the angle from your eye to the bottom and the top of the screen. That's what we wanna to try to maximize. All right, so how do we do that? Well, uh, you might notice this angle theta is not part of a, a right triangle, but we can write it as the difference between two angles, TEO, so that's part of right triangle TEO, um, and then BEO is the angle in this right triangle, BEO, right? And theta is just the difference between those two. Um, so what's nice about right triangles? Well, we've got some nice trig um, relationships we can bring in. You could write 
tangent of TEO, that larger angle, is going to be uh, 45, because that's the, the um, distance between the top of the screen all the way down to O, uh, divided by F. Right? Tangent is opposite over adjacent side. And do the same with uh, BEO, tangent of BEO is 20 over F. Um, but it turns out uh, you might notice that in those fractions, the X is in the denominator. It's going to be a lot easier when we start taking derivatives if we switch that around. Okay, so instead of looking at tangents, if we use cotangents, um, the cotangent of TEO, that's going to be X over 45 instead of 45 over X. And similarly, cotangent of BEO is going to be X over 20. All right, so if we use those relationships, take the inverse cotangent of each of those, then we can write theta as inverse cotangent of X over 45 minus inverse tangent of X over 20. Okay. Um, another advantage here, now we can actually talk about the value when X is zero, right? If we've done it the other way around, we have X in the denominator and you can't plug in zero there, get something defined, but now we can, okay? Um, in terms of the domain, X could be any uh, non-negative number, right? So presumably if you're driving a uh, movie theater, there's gonna be some uh, boundary. But we'll just assume for now, you could go back as far as you want. All right, so how do we um, maximize this function? Our favorite calculus method will take the derivative, set it equal to zero, uh, or see where it's undefined to find critical points. Um, and here, the, um, the differentiation is a little nicer with the inverse cotangent, but you do have to remember um, most folks uh, enjoy remembering the inverse. Uh, tangent derivative is one over one plus x squared for the inverse cotangent. Uh, it's just the negative of that, right? And that's a nice relationship between each of those co functions, All right? So, um, derivative of this first part is going to be negative one over, and then we'll have one plus x over 45 squared. So, then you have to multiply by the derivative of that fraction, x over 45. You get your one over 45. Do the same thing over here since it's negative. Minus a negative turns that into a positive. And then um, we could simplify these fractions um, by multiplying. So you notice over here, we've got a 45 in the denominator. That'll cancel one of the 45s in the denominator here, but not both of them. So if we multiply by 45 over 45 again, that'll give us a negative 45 over, and then here we'll have 45 squared plus x squared. Okay? Same thing over here, multiply by 20 over 20 to get this nice fraction over here. Okay, now most folks from this point would just set this equal to zero. Uh, you can move one fraction to the other side, cross multiply, solve for x. Um, that's a, a great thing to do, but if you'll allow me, instead I'm gonna keep this derivative here so that we can do a little more analysis later on. But if we get a common denominator instead, Uh, so instead of just multiplying the 45 into the binomial, uh, so the 40 instead of binomial, I just wondered. Yeah, so you can, but you're still going to have a 45. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you got a square root. You got, yeah, okay. So we need one more factor of 45 yeah, to get out of here. Okay. Um, but so if you instead get a common kind of denominator there, you might notice when you gather some terms in the numerator, um, here's what we're left with. We get a nice expression, 25. If you remember, that was the height of the screen. Um, and then 20 times 45 minus x squared. So that's kind of nice. Um, I bet you could tell me um, what solutions we would get if we set that equal to zero. But notice everything else here, the 25 and the two terms in the denominator, have to be positive, right? There's no question there. The 25 is positive. So the only way we could get this to be zero is if this term is zero, okay? And uh, what value of x are we looking for? 30, good deal. So 20 times 45, that's 900. So x squared equals 900, x is square root of 900. So plus or minus 30, but if you remember, x has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, good job. So x equals 30, that's the only 
critical point in our domain that goes from zero to infinity. All right, now, um, here's why I wanted to factor that derivative. Um, because uh, that 900 minus x squared, we could actually factor that as a difference of two squares. And now we can see where the derivative is positive and where it's negative. Okay, If x is between 0 and 30, then everything is positive. Um, so that derivative has to be positive, so the function's increase. Right? But if x is greater than 30, then the 30 minus x term is going to be negative. Everything else is positive. So the derivative is negative. So function is decreasing. That means you have to have uh, a maximum at x equals 30. Since it's the only critical point, it has to be the absolute maximum. Right? Um, so don't forget to put your answer back into words, as I tell my students, answer the question that was asked. Um, you should park 30 feet, a horizontal distance of 30 feet from the drive-in in order to get the best view. Okay, so nice little calculus problem, right? So the, the math wasn't too bad. Um, but suppose instead of just giving this one problem, you wanted to do lots of variations on this problem. Uh, how do we pick the, the 20 and the 25 for those initial numbers, right? Um, because it worked out nicely that the answer was uh, 30, right? A nice integer value. Um, so if we do this problem more generally, instead of with 20 and 45, um, and in fact, I'm going to change, instead of having the, the 25 was the uh, height of the screen, instead of using that distance, it's going to be more convenient to look at um, u as the distance from eye level to the bottom of the screen. That, that was our 20 feet in the original problem. But instead of v, we'll look at, um, sorry, instead of that 25 height of the screen, we'll look at the distance from uh, the eye level all the way up to the top of the screen. And we're going to call that variable v. Okay? So here the phrasing is the, the bottom and the top of the movie screen are u feet and v feet above eye level. All right? And then how far back from the screen should you park in order to have the best view? All right, and wanting to be nice to your students, you want them to have a nice answer. Maybe if you're doing this on an online platform, you don't want to have to worry about non-integer answers and how to enter those, right? That's another complication. Nice integer value of 30, that's easy for everybody to type in, okay? Um, so that leads to what I call the drive-in movie meta problem. Um, determine which pairs U and V of positive integers where u is less than v, all right, because remember u is the distance to the bottom of the screen, v is the distance to the top of the screen. So v has to be bigger than u or else you don't have any screen. Okay. Which pairs are going to give rise to an integer solution for like our x equals 30? Okay, so uh, same picture except the, the way the variables are labeled. Notice here v is the distance from O all the way up to T. U is still the distance uh, from O to the bottom of the screen. And um, the only difference now is we've got some variables where we used to have the, the constants uh, 20 and 25. Okay, so there's the function we're trying to maximize inverse cotangent of x over v minus inverse cotangent of x over u. And solving that is really no harder than when we did it with the specific values. We, we do it the same way. And you might recognize um, in that factored form of the derivative where we had the 25 in the denominator. Well, that's now our, our V minus U. Okay? So 45 minus 20, that's going to give us the, the 25. Uh, where we used to have 900 minus X squared, that's our U times V, right? Our 20 times 45. Um, and then the other terms down here as before. Um, so, just like we did before, uh, the only critical point is going to be when x is equal to the square root of u times v, that's square root of 900 is 30, and we know that that's going to give us the absolute maximum, right, because we can tell when the derivative is positive and negative, same argument that we had before. Okay, so let's call uh, a triple of integers u, v, and x a solution to the drive-in movie meta problem. If u, v, and x are all integers and, and u is less than v. Okay? 
Um, and then in our paper, one of the things um, Madhu and I did was to characterize all those solutions to that meta problem where you had nice values for u, v, and x, all integers. Um, and here's the, the answer. The only way you can get that is if u, v, and x have the form uh, d times m squared, d times n squared, and d times m n, where d, m, and n are all positive integers. M is less than N, so you're going to need that in order for U to be less than D. Um, and M and N are relatively prime, so they don't have any common factors. Okay. Uh, in our original problem, where we had 20 for U, 45 for V, right, because that was 20 plus 25, um, and then X equals 30 was the solution, uh, that occurs when D is equal to 5, so that's the, the greatest common divisor of those three numbers. You factor out the five from all those, you've got four comma nine comma six, and four is two squared, nine is three squared, and six is two times six. Okay, so that's that's our particular solution that we have with it. All right, let's um let's turn that around a little bit. Instead of starting with u and v, like we did in the problem and uh, asking your students to find the x, what if we started out knowing that we wanted a, a particular x and asked the question, how many pairs? Of integers u and v are there that will give us one of those nice triples, right? Where all three are integers. Um, so, for example, instead of x equals thirty, a little more interesting if we do x equals twelve. How many pairs u comma v will give us a solution that looks like u comma v comma twelve to our uh, drive-in movie problem? All right. So remember, what we needed was x was the square root of u times v or x squared is equal to u times v. Um, so in this case, if x is 12, x squared is going to be 144. So we want u times v to be equal to 144. And we're asking how many ways can we factor 144 into these pairs, u and v, where u is less than v, and they're both integers. Well, really, that's um, a fairly standard uh, counting problem. How do you count the number of divisors well, it depends on how you can factor 144 into prime. So 144, we can write as 2 to the fourth power times 3 to the second power. If d is any divisor of 144, uh, there are no other prime divisors. So it's going to have to look like some power of 2 times some power of 3. Right? And the power of a could be 0 if you just don't have any factors of 2. Um, and it can be as large as 4 because that's the, the highest power of two in 144. And similarly, three squared means B could either be zero, one, or two. All right, so if you're counting how many factors there are, that means we've got five choices for what A could be, right? Don't forget zero, zero, one, two, three, or four. And then B could be zero, one, or two. So if we've got five choices for the exponent A, three choices for the exponent B, how many choices do we have all together? Twelve? Fifteen. There we go. All right. Yeah, five times six. Right? Just multiplication principles all we're doing there. Um, the choice of exponents for two is independent from the choice of your exponents for six. Right? So you can do any one. All right. But remember, if we're requiring that u be strictly less than v, that means we're not allowed to pick u and v both equal to twelve. Right? nor are we allowed to have u greater than v. Right? We want um, only those factors where u is less than v. So basically, we're throwing away half of those um, and only picking the divisors for u that are going to be less than 12. Um, so the total we get, take that 15, we're going to subtract 1 for the, the way we could split 144 up into 12 times 12. And then for the remaining pairs, half of them are going to have u less than v. The other half is going to have u greater than v. So we'll divide that by 2. So 15 minus 1 is 14. Divide that by 2, you get 7. And here are the 7 pairs, right? If you just look at the, the first number for the u, um, we were looking at divisors of 144. Um, we're skipping the next factor of 12. And then the remaining ones are the factors that we use for v that are all larger than 12. Okay. 
So if you switch around any of those pairs, you get something where uh, u is greater than this. So we don't want that. All right, so how do we do that for a general x? Now that we've done it for x equals 12, you can probably guess. Um, the important part um, is what do you get in those exponents when you do the prime factorization of that? Right? So it didn't really matter that the factors, the prime factors were two and three. What really mattered was the exponents of two and three when we looked at the prime factorization. Right? So same thing here. Um, our, our next theorem, if X has a prime factorization that looks like this, say prime P1 raised to the power N1 times P2 raised to the N2, et cetera, um, then all we need are those exponents, n1, n2, up to nk. The answer is only going to depend on those. All right? And just like we did before, so remember, x was 12. When we squared that to get 144, that doubled the exponent that we had. So x squared would look like p1 to the 2 times n1, p2 times 2 times n2, right? And x squared, all those uh, powers of your primes are going to be now even. Right then, don't forget zero could be a possibility. So the um, choices for your divisor, you're going to have anything from zero up to two times n one for the power of that first prime. So that's two times n one plus one uh, choices. And same for the other exponents as well. Multiply those together. You want to subtract one because we're not allowing the pair x comma x, and then divide by two because you only want the ones where u is less than. Right? Just like we did before. All right, now, um, side note, you may have noticed here um, that that solution x is the square root of u times v. That, that actually has a name, right? That's known as the geometric mean of the two numbers u and v, right? The arithmetic mean is just the average, u plus v divided by 2. The geometric mean is the square root of u times v. Um, so uh, from that name, geometric mean, you might wonder, Huh, is there a geometric proof that this is the optimal distance where we want to park at the drive-in movie here? Um, so let me just back up. So what does that word geometric mean in this context? Well, when we talk about geometric mean, um, it's the same idea as when we talk about a geometric sequence. Um, the operation we're talking about is multiplication. Right? Compare that to an arithmetic mean where we're doing addition arithmetic sequence where you're adding to get to the next term instead of multiplying. So um, back as far as the ancient Greeks, multiplication was closely associated with the area of the side of a, a rectangle. They had a very geometric understanding of what multiplication was. Um, if you just told them multiply three times five, they didn't really think of that uh, other than in the context of how they're a uh, picture of rectangle, how to do that zoom in. Um, so in particular, uh, there's a nice representation of the geometric mean in, in Euclid's elements. Um, book six, proposition eight, if in a right angle triangle, a perpendicular is drawn from the right angle to the base, then the straight line so drawn is a mean proportional between the segments of the base. So the language is kind of old fashioned. Right, like uh, 2,500 years old fashioned. But um, the interpretation in modern language would be that the altitude x is going to be the geometric mean of those two distances, uh, a and b, that that um, altitude splits the base into. Right? Um, so, and remember, this is a right triangle up here. That was key. Um, in fact, you can uh, prove the converse as well. If you have a triangle like that, and the altitude x happens to be the geometric mean of a and b, then that means the angle opposite the base must be a right angle. Okay? All right, so how does that help us with our understanding of the drive and movie problem? Well, here's the picture we were looking at. Um, and now I've reflected that triangle, TEO about the horizontal line EO, so that um, T gets reflected to this point T prime down here, okay? Now let's, let's think about that um, new picture a little bit. So uh, the distance between T prime and O is the same as the distance between T and O, so that's just our distance V. 
and the distance um, t prime e is going to be the same as the distance t e from our reflection. Okay. All right. So what we're going to show is as you um, move your point e, uh, starting all the way at zero, right up next to the screen, and pull that out to the right, um, then the viewing angle that we're interested in, remember that was uh, angle B, E, T up here, that that's going to be maximized exactly when this angle B, E, T prime over here is going to be a right angle. Okay, and we'll, we'll actually prove that in just a second, but then you can use Euclid's um, interpretation of the geometric mean to say, well, you get a right angle over here exactly when X is the geometric mean of U and Z. Right? If you recognize that right angle just turned on its side from our picture in the previous slide. Okay. All right. So how do we show that um, that viewing angle BBT is going to be maximized when BBT prime is a right angle? Right? We boil down to that point. Well, so first notice um, angle EBT, so the EBT, that's this one over here, and EBT prime, those two angles are supplementary, right? So their signs are going to be the same, right? Sine of alpha is same as pi, sine of pi minus alpha. Okay, so keep that in mind. And we're going to use the law of signs as well. We start out with the sine of angle BET, that's our viewing angle that we're interested in. And divide by, uh, remember this distance in green, that's the height of the movie screen. So that's V minus U over there. So sine of angle BET divided by V minus U, that distance, should be equal to the sine of EBT over here. That's this angle. Divided by the length of the opposite side, that's going to be TE, that distance over there. Okay. Now, remember we said angle EBT and EBT prime were uh, supplementary, so they have the same sign. So that sign in the numerator here is equal to the sign of the numerator here. And distance T prime E is the same as distance TE from our reflection. Okay? And then now we'll use the law of signs again in our uh, triangle BET prime to say the sign of angle EB. T prime, so that's this angle over in here, divided by E T prime, or sorry, T prime E, that distance, should be the same as the sine of angle B E T prime, right? That's over here, divided by its opposite length, which is U plus E over here. Okay? So from the left, we've got sine of our viewing angle, B E T, divided by V minus U is equal to the sine of angle BET prime divided by V plus U. Okay, now, if you just multiply both sides of that equation by V minus U, then here's what you get. The sine of our viewing angle, BET, is equal to, that's going to be V minus U divided by V plus U times sine of angle BET prime. Okay, but remember, U and V are both constants in this problem. They're fixed. So what we've written is the sign of our viewing angle as a, a positive constant multiple of the sign of angle BET prime. So when do you get the largest possible value for that viewing angle? Well, it's going to be when you get the largest possible value for the sign of angle BET prime. Right? And the largest you can get for the sign is when the angle is a right angle. Right, sine of pi over two is equal to one. You can't get any bigger than that. Okay. All right. So, conclusion: our um, angle BET. Um, well, the sine of angle BET is going to be maximized if and only if angle BET prime, that's this angle over here, is a right angle. Right. And from Euclid's corollary, that tells us. That happens exactly when X is the geometric mean of U and V. Okay, so that really was a nice answer to our uh, drive-in movie problem. All right, one thing you might notice, let me go back for just a second. So what is the maximum viewing angle? So we, we haven't really mentioned that. 
But what it's going to be if the sine of the maximum viewing angle is this fraction times, well, the remember the maximum of this sine of pi over two is just one. That's the largest that can be. So this fraction, b minus u over b plus u, is the maximum value of the sine of angle BET. And since angle BET is acute, right, it has to be somewhere between zero and pi over two. That means that the, the maximum value of the angle itself is just the inverse sine of this fraction. Okay, so inverse sine of b minus u over b plus u, that's our maximum value for the viewing angle, if you care. All right, so one more twist, you might want to ask, well, um, it was nice to have u, v, and x all be integers, but could we get the viewing angle to be, well, maybe not an integer, but if we measure it in degrees, can it be rational at least? Or equivalently, you could say, is it a rational number multiplied by pi? Something like pi over six, right? pi over four, one of our fun nice values. Um, well, there's a theorem of um, number theorist Ivan Niven um, that proves if an angle is rational in degrees, then the only possible values of the sine of the angle are going to be zero, plus or minus a half, and plus or minus one. Okay. So we've got a pretty small list to work from. And of those, if our angle is acute, and it's strictly in between zero and pi over two, then that rules out almost everything in that list except for one half, right? So it could be if you have pi over six, sine of pi over six is equal to one half. All right, but let's see, if this fraction b minus u over b plus u is equal to a half, you do a little cross multiplying, um, two b minus two u is equal to b plus u, gather some terms together, that'll tell you that V has to be equal to three times U. Okay, but that's not gonna work very well for X being an integer, because remember X is the square root of U times V, so that would be the square root of U times three U, or the square root of three U squared. Well, the U squared is nice, we can take the square root of that, but then we still got the square root of three underneath the radical. Okay, and if u is an integer, then square root of three times u can't be rational. That has to be irrational, right? Um, okay, so here's the theorem. If you have positive integers u and v with u less than v, there are no solutions to the drive-in movie problem in which that uh, solution x, the optimal horizontal distance, and the maximum viewing angle are both rational. Okay, so you, you can't have all of that. All right, now, next problem. Enough about drive-in movies. Let's talk about solar panels. All right, here's my second favorite uh, angle optimization problem, uh, the solar panel problem. So suppose you have an alley in Quito, Ecuador, and it's bounded by walls on the left and the right that are A meters and B meters high. All right now, if the alley runs north-south and the alley is C meters wide, Here's the question, where should a solar panel be placed in the alley in order to maximize its time in the sun on September 25th? Okay, so that's a little contrived, I, I grant you. But why the heck are we in Quito and why are we looking at September 25th? Um, on the equator, bingo. And what about September 22nd? What's interesting about that? The fall equinox. Good. One of the two days of the year where the sun uh, rises exactly due east and is going to set exactly due west when you're on the equator in Quito. All right. So that's just a, a kind of lighthearted way to say this boils down to this two dimensional picture. Right. If the sun is too low in the sky uh, in the east, then it's going to be blocked by the wall of height B meters. Um, it has to get above that in order to hit the solar panel somewhere in the alley, right? And you might ask, well, why in the world would you put a solar panel in an alley? Why not just put it on the roof? It, you're absolutely right. But again, uh, that takes away from the fun of the problem. All right, so what this boils down to, um, as y'all correctly pointed out, um, September 22nd is a nice day, so everything works nicely in our problem. So all we have to do is maximize that angle theta in the, the picture there. Okay, so we've got a, a wall on the left that's A meters high, a wall on the right that's B meters high. Our alley is C meters wide. 
And X is going to be, we'll say, the distance from the wall on the left to where we place the solar panel. So we want to find the value of X that's going to maximize this angle theta in here. Okay. Because the sun has to be somewhere in that region in order for it to hit the solar panel. All right, so there's the, the picture again. And really, the problem's not too much harder than what we did before. Here, um, theta, we're going to write as uh, pi, so that's um, half a revolution over here, minus these two angles in here. And each of those two angles, like we did before, we can write in terms of the inverse cotangent of a ratio of sides of the right triangle. All right, so inverse cotangent of x over a, that's going to give us this angle over here on the left. And uh, inverse cotangent, this will be C minus X over here divided by C. That's the angle on the right. Okay, so pi minus each of those gives us uh, the angle theta that we want to try to maximize. This time, it only makes sense for X to be between zero and C, right? C is the width of the atom, so you can't go beyond that. All right, so here are the calculations for the derivative. Again, not too much different from what we did before. Uh, we don't get something quite as nice in the numerator, but here's what it looks like. A minus B times X squared minus two ACX plus A times that quantity, B squared plus C squared minus AB, all over, and then notice in the denominator, both those terms are positive, right? All right and then here it is repeated. Um, first, just notice, well, what if A is equal to B, right? If your two walls have the same height, yeah, then put it in the middle, right? That's um, the answer that makes sense. And sure enough, um, if you uh, have A being equal to B, these terms cancel, so you're just left with these. A, B is really the same as B squared, so those two terms cancel. Uh, so you get down to this, which you can factor like this, which is equal to zero exactly when X is C over two. So you wanna place the, the solar panel exactly in the middle if your two walls have the same height. Right, which is fairly clear, but not so interesting. Um, if A is greater than B, then we really do get a, a quadratic in X up in the numerator, then, then it becomes a little more interesting. Um, now, that's not the easiest thing to factor, but you can do it if we introduce a new variable called T, which is going to be equal to this quantity, right? the square root of AB times, in brackets, A minus B squared plus C squared. Okay, and um, notice that that has to be positive, at least, right, because A, B are positive, and then we're taking the sum of C squared, um, but there's certainly no guarantee that's going to be an integer, right, we, that's going to be part of the problem is finding nice values for A, B, and C to make this T an integer. Okay, but just in terms of solving the calculus problem, um, here's our derivative in that factored form, where T is equal to this. Uh, so the, the critical points are going to be where each of those two factors in the numerator is equal to zero. Um, and if you solve for X in each of those, that's not too hard. You get AC plus or minus T, all right, so plus for one of these and minus for the other, divided by A minus B. Um, now, there's no guarantee that those values of X will be in the domain in between zero and C, right? In fact, it turns out if you use the plus sign over here, that's always going to be greater than C. It's going to be outside of your domain. So at best, we've got one of those two solutions that's going to be in the domain that we want. All right, and then uh, here's what we proved about the solutions for that uh, solar panel problem. A, B, and C are positive integers. A is greater than or equal to B. Um, the optimal placement of the solar panel will be at a distance X from the left wall, that's the one of height A meters, where, all right, here you go, um, X is just C over two, right? Exactly in the middle if A is equal to B. Um, X is equal to zero, so it's gonna be right at that left-hand wall if C squared happens to be less than or equal to A minus B times C, okay? Or if you like, you could rephrase that inequality as C is less than or equal to the square root of A minus B times C. Uh -huh. Sounds like a geometric mean popping into our story again. So it turns out, yeah, that's going to be the dividing line between that second bullet and the third. 
right? Here's really the interesting solution where we get to use the T. X is going to be equal to AC minus T over A minus B, where T is equal to that quantity. If A is greater than B, and um, we reverse this inequality over here, A minus B times B is strictly less than C squared. Okay? All right. Um, in that third case, uh, just notice the only way we're going to get X to be rational is if T turns out to be an integer. Right? That's the square root of an integer. So the only way that's going to be rational is if T itself is an integer. Okay. Um, and here are some nice values if you want to, you know, give lots of variations of this problem to your calculus students. Um, my personal favorite, next to last one down here at the bottom, A is 9, B is 8, C is 7. Turns out X is equal to 3. Um, lovely value. Isn't that great? So nine meters, eight meters for your wall, seven meters in between. Where do you put the solar panel? Well, three meters from the left end, right? Nice, lovely answer. Here's some others. Um, you might notice, let's look at the third line. A is equal to B, right? Well, if C is six, then you, you put X halfway in between, right? Here's an example uh, in the fourth line where A is seven, B is five, C is three. X in that case is zero. All right, well, that's an integer value, but it's uh, from that second bullet item where uh, the value of C is going to be less than the geometric mean of A minus B and B. Okay, so in other words, your your alley wasn't really wide enough to get something interesting going on. And the last one is almost an integer. Yeah, yeah, it's close. Um, and notice, yeah, the last one and the what, third from last one, we get something that we didn't get in the drive and move problem. That is, a solution for x that's rational but not an integer. Okay, in the drive and movie problem, um, all rational solutions had to be integers. It was impossible to get uh, a rational solution that was not an integer for the drive and movie problem because you're just taking the square root of the product of two integers. Right? Um, but here we can get uh, things like 80 over 9, okay, um, 21 over 2. So, uh, yeah, just as I remarked, it is possible to have rational non-integer solutions. Now, another difference is, remember, we also looked at the, um, the optimal angle in the drive-in movie problem and said we couldn't have the best of all worlds. Well, that angle is a rational multiple of pi, and the solution is an integer. We couldn't get both of them. Um, here we can. So let me um, call this the extended solar panel meta problem. All right, so here's the setup. We're trying to figure out which triples A, B, and C are positive integers with A greater than or equal to B. Remember, those are the heights of the wall. Give rise to a rational solution for the optimal horizontal distance, X, and a rational multiple of pi for the maximum angle of sunlight. Okay, so can we get all of those things to happen? And it turns out, yes, we can. Um, we'll see. Uh, we can, in, in fact, uh, give parameterization for all of those possibilities. All right. Um, now, one thing that's not too hard to show is that if you have um, a, a four tuple, A, B, C, and X, that's a solution to this extended solar panel meta problem, then X is not only going to be rational, it's going to have to be an integer, right? Now, remember in the table we looked at before, we saw some rational values that were not integers, but those were going to have maximum sunlight angles that are not rational multiples of pi. All right. So if you also impose that restriction, then the only rational values you're going to get for X are going to have to be integers. Okay. Uh, and let me just mention so we'll call that four tuple a primitive solution if uh, the greatest common divisor of those four numbers is one. In other words, there's no common factor that they all share. Okay, call that a, a primitive solution. Um, and that's actually what we're going to elaborate. Once you, once you have a primitive solution, you can multiply all four of those numbers by the same constant and you get another solution that works just as well. Okay. All right, so here's a theorem that tells us what we get for that maximum angle in each of the three uh, bullet cases. If A is equal to B, it turns out to be this, inverse cotangent of this fraction. Um, if we had uh, 
another way to phrase it is C less than or equal to the square root of A minus B times B, we get the inverse cotangent of this uh, fraction. And remember, A, B, and C are integers, so these are all rational numbers that we're taking the inverse cotangent of. And then um, the third case, if A is greater than B and C is greater than the geometric mean of these, then we get inverse cotangent of this point. Right. Um, now that same theorem of, of Nivens tells us about uh, when can the cotangent of a, a rational multiple of pi be itself a rational number. And um, in this case, the only values we can get uh, are going to be zero and plus or minus one for a, a cotangent. For sine, it was uh, zero plus or minus a half and plus or minus one. Here it's only zero and plus or minus one for the cotangent. Oh. No problem. Um, so, um, what are those values? Well, the um, cotangent of pi over two is equal to zero, right? So the inverse cotangent of zero is pi over two. Um, inverse cotangent of one, same as the inverse tangent of one, that's pi over four. And then the inverse cotangent of negative one is going to be three pi over four, right? So those are the three values that we can get for the maximum sunlight angle that are actually rational multiples of pi, right? The only one. Okay, so in each of those cases, if A is equal to B, um, remember that was the boring case, the walls have the same height, then you're gonna put X in the middle. So sure enough, X um, is gonna be A here, that's half of two A. So the only four tuples you're gonna get are gonna look like this. B is equal to A, so A, then A. C is just gonna be twice that, and X is gonna be the same as A and B. All right. Then in that case, you get the angle being pi over two. All right. For that second case where the solar panel is right up next to the left hand wall, so x is zero. Um, well, you can get that to happen if the angle is pi over four. Um, and that will happen when what? C is equal to B. All right. So as long as A is greater than or equal to B, then this will give you a solution for that problem. But really, the interesting case is the, the third one. All right? What happens if A is greater than B and C is greater than the geometric mean of A minus B and B? All right, so this one um, is not quite as pretty, but the first part um, actually is pretty, pretty nice. If your uh, maximum sunlight angle is pi over two, so a right angle, then it turns out here's the nice parameterization for that four tuple A, B, C, and F. All right, A is M squared, B is N squared, C is two times M times N, and X is equal to M times N. So you might notice over here, hey, this looks awfully familiar. X is gonna be then the geometric mean of A and B, All right? Similar to what we had in the drive-in movie problem. All right, now M and N have to be relatively prime positive integers. N has to be less than M to make sure A is going to be greater than or equal to B. So actually in this part, remember A has to be uh, greater than B. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, because we said at the top, A has to be greater than B. All right, what if um, you have a viewing angle of pi over four for your maximum angle? Well, here are the more complicated parameterizations for that. A, B, C, X can be one of these two over here with some bounds on, on what M and N represent. Um, with the maximum sunlight angle of three pi over four, then where we were subtracting in these terms over here, we're gonna be adding. So notice C is gonna be relatively large compared to A and B. And if your viewing angle is three pi over four, that obtuse angle, you're gonna to have to have a pretty wide alley and pretty short walls for that to happen, okay? All right, so here are some values to look at. First, if um, theta is pi over four, and you might notice there's uh, there's our favorite example, nine, eight, seven, and three, right there. It just so happens that that example gives you uh, a nice angle, uh, pi over four, for your maximum sunlight angle, right? Um, some other values that we get for those parameterizations. So basically what's going on in, in this first set of numbers, A is an odd square, B is going to be two times a perfect square, okay? That's what we need for our parameterizations, and then here's what we get for C and A. 
uh, for this second uh, column over here, here B is going to be an odd square. A is going to be a multiple of, uh, sorry, two times the square. And then we get some values like this. Okay. Um, similarly, you can find some values uh, for when theta is three pi over four. Um, and notice you can get A and B to be pretty close. Here's 50, 49. Um, the C has to be pretty big, though, in order to get that angle of 3 pi over 4. Okay, so in all of these, C is fairly large relative to A and B. All right, one more final comment. Um, you might have noticed that when that maximum angle of sunlight is um, a right angle, uh, we had X being equal to the geometric mean, right? We mentioned that of A and B. And C was um, two times X. In other words, X was C divided by two. So the optimal placement of your solar panel was going to be right in the middle of the L. Well, um, remember that also happens when you have two walls that have the same height. Okay. So you might wonder, are there any other times that could happen when you put the solar panel right in the middle? Right. If the two walls have the same height, you can do it then. Sorry, we're almost finished. Then... Um, if your optimal sunlight angle is a uh, right angle, pi over two, then it happens as well. Um, well. It turns out those are the only two times it happens. So we can prove um, if that optimum placement is exactly in the middle of the alley, then either the walls have the same height or that maximum sunlight angle is going to be a right angle. Okay? Those are the only times that can happen. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have just a couple minutes left for questions. Uh, but let me open up, see if anybody here or on Zoom has any questions for us. 